is here. Now, broadcasting from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. I cannot believe Donald Trump is looking at Bob Corker again for Secretary of State. I'm telling you, we're going to try and fight it tooth and nail if he nominates him, but I'll get to that in the third hour. Ladies and gentlemen, hope you had a great Thanksgiving. I'm Mark Levin. Our number, 877-381-3811. 877-381-3811. Yes, Castro's dead. We'll deal with that. Yes, there was an attack at Ohio State by a... Uh, an Islamist, naturalized American. And the reason we bring people in like this is because that's who we are as Americans, you see. We're all immigrants. We're a nation of immigrants. But we're not a nation of uh, suicidal citizens, are we? There's a coup d'etat underway, too, ladies and gentlemen, with the left trying to uh, abuse the electoral college system while pretending they're following the Constitution, which they never do, in an unprecedented effort to bastardize the election, there's a war, let me put it this way, there's a war on Republican government. Not Republican Party government, Republican. Little r, Republican government, with this coup d'etat attempt. Backed by Soros, the hard left, and of course the Clinton machine. All intended not just to taint Trump, and to take any momentum away from his agenda. But to taint the republic itself. Because this is what the left does. We have an advisor to Trump by the name of Stephen Moore. He's been bouncing around Washington a long time. From libertarian think tanks to conservative think tanks to this, that, and the other. Who's told Republicans on uh, Capitol Hill, you're no longer the party of Reagan. You're the party of Trump. Why would you even say that? Are we not the party of Lincoln? Are we not the party of Coolidge? Do the Democrats talk about FDR this way? And I hope to get into that as well. We'll get into all these things. But first, let's get into not just the death of Castro. Man lived to 90. Why do evil people live so long? Why do evil people live so long? This is a horrific human being. A horrific, evil, demonic human being. A genocidal maniac in a small country, killing tens of thousands of people, torturing, imprisoning, breaking up families, people trying to flee his police state island, murdered on the high seas, murdered. He was a drug runner with that stupid little brother of his, Raul talk about his family. How do they even know what his family is? The man had mistresses galore. He had illegitimate children all over the place. Can't even keep count. Here's a guy who bans Christmas. A man who almost started a nuclear war between the old Soviets and our country. And praise is heaped upon him by the Prime Minister of Canada, a truly buffoonish human being. A milk toast, or worse, statement put out by Barack Obama and so forth. But what do you expect, folks? Let me tell you a dirty little secret. The left in this country loves dictatorships. As long as their side is in office. The left loves soft dictatorships, hard dictatorships. It doesn't matter. As long as they have the patina of communism or Marxism, as do all collectivist ideologies, whether they claim to be socialists or neo-Marxists or whatever they are. Progressives. Oh, yes, progressives. They all have the taint of Marxism. And so they defend it. 
you know, Castro wasn't a mass murder, a fiend, a sick egomaniac. No. He was a man trying to do well by the people. Give them health care and education, don't you know? The ones that actually lived, the ones that actually didn't die from from uh, being malnourished and so forth. Oh, yes, yes. It's a uh, worker's paradise, the little island. Barack Obama and Fidel Castro actually were quite close. When Barack Obama first came into office in 2009, I noticed this. I noticed these two were awfully close. And you know in your heart of hearts that Obama admired Castro. Much as he admires the regime in Iran. Much as he despises republics. Here is what I said in August 2009. Cut one, go. It appears that Barack Obama has one steadfast ally. It appears that Barack Obama has one friend who will not abandon him. And his name is Fidel Castro. His name is Fidel Castro. This from the Associated Depressed. Cuba's Fidel Castro is criticizing Barack Obama's stepped-up U.S. war in Afghanistan while backing Obama's effort to provide health care coverage for all Americans. Listen to the whole story. The former Cuban president said in an essay published today that he hasn't the slightest doubt that the racist right will do anything to stop Obama by succeeding by, uh, from succeeding domestically. Gee, doesn't he sound like Paul Krugman, the nitwit, phony economist who writes for the New York Slimes? Doesn't he sound like the mental midget and physical midget Frank Rich who writes for the New York Slimes? Doesn't he sound like the, uh, the woman who dresses up like a hooker, Maureen Dowd at the uh, New York Slimes? Gee, doesn't he sound like damn near every leftist in this country? Yes, he does. Doesn't he sound like that idiot? On MSLSD, Screwball on Screwball, a.k.a. I want to drink uh, Chris Matthews. The former Cuban president said in an essay published Tuesday that he hasn't the slightest doubt that the racist right will do anything to stop Obama from su his uh, agenda from succeeding domestically. Castro's remarks appeared in the Cuba debate website. Oh, yeah, they have debates in Cuba. The Cuba debate website, which publishes his frequent essays on global affairs, he formally stepped down as Cuba's president in February 08 after ceding power to his brother Raul. The strategy of withdrawing troops from Iraq and sending them to the war in Afghanistan to fight the Taliban is a mistake. The Soviets sank there, wrote Castro, who was a close ally of the Soviets at the time. The United States' European allies are more and more unwilling to spill the blood of their soldiers in that country. Even so, Castro said he is read with astonishment. News reports on U.S. public opinion polls suggesting a decline in Obama's performance ratings. Obama, he said, quote, didn't want to, nor could he change the system. What's odd is that despite this, the extreme right hates him for being African-American and fights what the president does to improve the deteriorated image of that country. Castro cited Obama's efforts on health care, reviving the economy, closing tax havens, immigration reform, and climate change. That's right. Let me be blunt. Obama's agenda domestically and maybe otherwise, has a very interesting parallel to Castro's. Gee, did Marx say that? No, Castro said it. Obama has inherited those problems from President George W. Bush. He, wrote, he even sounds like the DNC. It's Bush's fault, says Castro. I don't harbor the least doubt that the racist right will do everything possible to wear him down, blocking his agenda to take him out of the game one way or another, he added. I hope I'm wrong, and I hope you drop dead, Castro. What do you think of that? Why is it that mass genocidal murderers like him live till they're 80-something or 90-something and some brave yank going to Iraq, 18, 19 years old, is killed? Why is it? Because the world is unfair. Castro. Castro. Uh, don't worry, Obama. You got your supporter in Castro. I, for one, am not surprised. Their ideology is really not all that far apart. I'm happy to debate this. You know, the left in this country, on the one hand, they, they worship Michael Moore, who goes down to Cuba and loves the health care system. Meanwhile, that fat slob, he would never go there to be treated. Neither would any of the leftists, because they like clean needles, toilet paper, washed sheets, and all those other little things that you can't get in Castro's Cuba. It's a real sick mentality these people have, really sick. On the one hand... 
On the one hand, you know damn well what they're trying to do. They never embrace capitalism. They never embrace success. They never embrace profits, creation of wealth. They never embrace success. They nationalize industries. They undermine industries. They demonize industries. And then when you call them on, hey, what are you suggesting? I'm not a Marxist? Hey, what are you suggesting? I'm not a socialist? Excuse me. Yes, you are. We'll be right back. So Castro, Castro is is making it clear that he likes Obama, his buddy, his domestic agenda. How come Brian Williams isn't doing that story? How come Charles Gibson isn't doing that story? How come Katie Couric's not doing that story? How come none of the morning shows tomorrow will do that story? Why not? All right. That's from <laughs> August 2009. Now, that is why the left will not condemn Castro. Who on the hard left has condemned Castro? I haven't heard a single one. Not one. The leader of the Democrat Party, the President of the United States, doesn't condemn Castro. The Prime Minister of Canada doesn't condemn Castro. Incredible, isn't it? Castro has slaughtered tens of thousands of innocent human beings. They don't call for gun control, any kind of control, do they? Where was Bernie Sanders today? Bernie Sanders is a Castrophile. Bernie Sanders is a Castrophile. I'll give an example. This is from October of last year. Bernie Sanders and me. Cut to go. Castro-loving Marxist Bernie Sanders. He's not a democratic socialist. He's a Marxist, ladies and gentlemen. He's defending a brutal genocidal communist regime in Cuba. The evidence is unequivocal. And a communist regime that tried to rise up in Nicaragua, and by the way, is back. He's defending communist regimes, not democratic socialism in Scandinavia. Bernie Sanders, 30 years ago, 1985, on Fidel Castro and the genocidal police state, that has gulags and has executed opponents, people just disappear, shoots people, sinks their boats if they try to escape the police state. Cut seven, go. You may recall way back in, what was it, 1961, they invaded Cuba. And everybody was totally convinced that Castro was the worst guy in the world. All the Cuban people were going to rise up in rebellion against Fidel Castro. They forgot that he educated their kids, gave them health care, totally transformed the society. You know, not to say that uh, Fidel Castro or Cuba are perfectly, are certainly not. Stop, 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 stop. Do I even have to explain what a nut job this man is? And he is supported right now by about 25 to 30 percent of the Democrat Party. He's not talking about family leave and all the rest. He is defending a died-in-the-wool, mass murder, Marxist, police state, genocidal regime. A communist regime. He's a propagandist for this communist regime, pretending that the kids are educated, they have free health care. He's transformed that society. This is where the left ultimately takes us. It's a matter of logic. This is inevitably where you go when you believe in a centralized government that coerces, that squeezes the vitality out of a nation. This is what he means by equality. Go ahead. Just because Ronald Reagan dislikes these people does not mean to say that the people in their own nation... Ronald Reagan dislikes these people. He sure as hell did. So did John Kennedy. So did Lyndon Johnson. So did Richard Nixon. So did Gerald Ford. So did all of them. Until we came to Barack Obama, who was of like mind with Bernie Sanders. Of like mind. Go ahead. The same way. So they expected a tremendous uprising in Cuba. In How can you have a tremendous uprising in Cuba when it's a police state? They kill people who rise up. What do you think? This is America? They take their opposition. They bring them into these, these prisons. They beat them. They torture them. They execute them. People rise up. This must be Bernie Sanders' idea of utopia. Iran, utopia. North Korea, utopia. Venezuela, utopia. America, however, is horrible. 
This is one sick bastard. There's no question about it. With 25 to 30 percent of the support from the Democrat Party. Go ahead and finish up. They are expecting a tremendous uprising in Nicaragua. They are very, very, very... Nicaragua, another communist regime. Daniel Ortega. Daniel Ortega. So now you know when I say that these people are Marxists. They're Marxists. Oh, they want to, you know, dumb it down and make you feel comfortable, disarm you, just relax mentally. Oh, it's no big deal. It's no big deal. Oh, we just want to take care of, you know, sick kids. We just want to make sure people have equal pay. Oh, we just want to take care of the bankers on Wall Street. It's like I've said about this guy. He sounds like a Marxist because he is a Marxist. And shame on the people of Vermont. Shame on the people of Vermont for sending this man to the United States Senate. He is a disgrace. And it wasn't just Ronald Reagan who dislikes the Castro boys. It's the tens of thousands of people who fled Cuba and the tens of thousands more who would like to flee Cuba. Bernie Sanders, 30 years ago. Hat tip, CNS News. Mark Lovin. Take a listen to our media in this country. Matthews, Rivera, Avila, Williams, Mitchell, cut three, go. He was a romantic figure when he came into power. And when he knocked off a corrupt dictator, Batista, we American young young high school kids and kids in those days rooted like mad for the guy. Uh, but when I think of Castro now, I think of this charismatic guy. He was the most sought-after interview back in the 1970s. I think that the Cubans have a tremendous sense of pride over uh, the, the, his legacy, and, that I, and I think that he will be remember, remembered fondly. Fidel Castro was considered, even to this, to this day, the George Washington of his country among those who remain in Cuba. You see the medicine system they are very proud of. You see athletes, and think of how many Cuban athletes have enriched the sports in this country and around the world. By then a declared socialist, he dramatically improved health care and literacy. Is this beyond belief? No, this is the left. Don't ever forget it. I'll be right back. Mark Levin, America's tyranny hunter. Call in now, 877-381-3811. Where's Millhouse today, Mr. Producer? Is he around? Or is he busy uh, spitting out another thousand regulations today? Nothing on his schedule. Normally, I'd say that's good. That means we're, we're safe, but we're really not. Did he put out a statement today about the Islamo-Nazi from Somalia? The uh, the the uh, newly uh, what American legalized American a refugee uh, who ran down a bunch of people with a bus at Ohio State. Did he mention any of that today? Are we aware of this? I don't believe he did. He didn't say a thing. Nothing. Nothing. So uh, this morning, as reported by Conservative Review. An active shooter alert was sent out by the Ohio State University Emergency Management Team. As a man, an 18-year-old, de- identified as Abdul Razak Ali Artin Yabadabadu. I don't believe he's Irish or Italian. I don't think he's an Orthodox Jew or a Mormon. I don't think he's Buddhist or Hindu. Recklessly attacked individuals on campus grounds with a car and a knife. And by the way, the nut jobs on the left were calling for gun control. Let me repeat, he attacked with a car and a knife. Artan crashed his vehicle into pedestrians on campus, then emerged from his vehicle brandishing a butcher knife, proceeding to assault several people on the scene. I wish I was there with my 357 Magnum. I'm not kidding. 
At least nine people were hospitalized, including one in critical condition, CNN reported. There's a hero here. An officer. Alan Harukjoko. H-O-R-U-J-K-O. He shot and killed Abdul Rasakh Ali Artan Yabadabadu. Shot and killed him. The officer arrived about a minute later, according to USA Today, and engaged the subject. Artan was fatally shot by the officer. Alan Harukjoko joined the Ohio State University Police Department in January of 2015. He studied security and intelligence at Ohio State University and graduated in 2012 after working with student safety services. That's kind of what led me to wanting to become a police officer, he told The Lantern, the university newspaper, after earning his badge. Previously an engineer major, the officer said he did not feel as passionately about engineering as his classmates did. I just couldn't see myself sitting in a cubicle. By working as a student safety uh, service uh, individual and seeing what police do and what student safety does on the campus, the kind of behind-the-scenes stuff really led me to a law enforcement career. Now he saved a bunch of lives. President-elect Donald Trump commended the Ohio State University emergency team and thanked the first responders for their service and actions. We haven't heard a damn thing out of Obama that I'm aware of. His uh, schedule is clear today. Maybe he's wanting to give out more medals of freedom to more friends. Maybe he skipped a few. Maybe he's working on the, the library, the, uh, the Barack Millhouse, Benito, Obama library with a really big Marxist wing. All the left-wing kook books you can fit in there. And another wing for community activists. So forth and so on. But our great leader... Uh, has not been heard from. Now, I want to tell you something else while I'm on the subject of law enforcement. Here was a piece from Fox News late last week. Sixty law enforcement officers fatally shot this year. Sixty. Twenty in ambushes. Sixty. Died in firearms-related incidents in 2016 marking a 67% increase since 2015, the, law, the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Fund reported. That's through November 23rd. The worst single attack was in July, as we know, in Dallas, with the execution of five officers. Ten days later, the execution of three Baton Rouge, Louisiana officers. So 60 law enforcement officers have been fatally shot, 20 in ambushes. And that's, in my view, due to many things. The breakdown of our culture, the breakdown of discipline and the rule of law, and the breakdown of political leadership, which condemns law enforcement, which looks at every opportunity to condemn law enforcement. And then, this... This young guy, maybe he should have gotten the Medal of Freedom. All kinds of people in the military, all kinds of people in law enforcement who could have received Medals of Freedom. Instead, multimillionaire athletes, multimillionaire actors, like that idiot, De Niro, among others. All right, let's move along. Gosh, there's so much to do here. But it's fun, isn't it? Yes, it is. Donald Trump won the presidency of the United States under our constitutional republic. He's the president-elect. Under our constitutional republic, he received most of the electoral college votes, or should I say over 270. You need 270 or more, and he easily received that. There's now an effort underway because he lost the popular vote by over 2 million votes, and that is substantial. But that's not what chooses the president. There's now an effort underway to smear him, to attack any legacy, excuse me, any mandate he may have, and to smear the country. 
It's the same left-wing goon mentality that undermines all aspects of our Constitution, especially separation of powers. Never before in American history have there been a collection of electors who have sought to change the results of an election. Never before in American history. Oh, there's been a knucklehead here and there, but never a concerted effort by a political party, by billionaires like Soros, by left-wing ideologues. Never, ever has there been an effort like taking place today. The same people who said Trump better accept the results, the same people who said that it harms democracy in our republic, by just saying he he may not accept the results, it depends on what happens, are now involved in a nefarious coup d'etat. That's right, I said it, a coup d'etat. Their goal is to displace the president-elect and to replace him with Hillary Clinton. That is their goal. They are funded by a myriad of leftists, millionaires and billionaires, who have as their goal the collapse of American society. They are supported by radical leftists who have no regard whatsoever for our constitutional system in any respect. Supported by a political party that is a party of the new left, the radical left. It's not the old Democrat party, which is why they lost. We have an anti-Trump presidential elector suing to unbind states' election results. With the U.S. Green Party raising enough funds for a Wisconsin recount. The Clinton campaign will participate in the Wisconsin recount. While uh, while their lawyer that they've hired, some hack left-wing litigator, is trying to stop the recount of North Carolina that involves the governorship there, he wants this recount to go on with respect to Hillary Clinton. This fellow, Richard Baer, at American Thinker, got it exactly right. He says, the recount in Wisconsin and the coming ones in Michigan and Pennsylvania, there will not be a coming one in Pennsylvania because these fools missed the deadline. Why not change the outcomes in any of the states? No recount ever changes thousands of votes. I don't think that's the purpose, he writes. The recounts, if done by hand, which can be demanded, but that was just rejected in Wisconsin, but I want to get to his larger point. may take longer than so forth and so on. But what he says here, that Trump, what they're trying to do is push Trump below or close to the 270 number on Electoral College. To disgrace him. Even better if they can get it under the 270, because then they can say he neither won the popular vote nor the Electoral College vote. It's thrown to the House of Representatives under our Constitution, where then they would uh, vote f among the top three Electoral College vote getters. And of course, since there are more Republican state delegations, and each state delegation gets one vote, Trump would still be the president. But their goal, you see, is to delegitimize the election. So where is Obama? Where is Hillary Clinton? Where are all these buffoons who went on and on and on about accepting the results of an election? This started with Al Gore. When the election was stolen from Richard Nixon by the Kennedy clan in 1960, with the fake votes out of Chicago, the fake votes out of West Virginia, the fake votes out of Texas, when the election was stolen from Richard Nixon in 1960, he was urged to bring litigation. And he said, no, I cannot put the country through that. Nixon said that. When Al Gore lost Florida, he lost the popular vote in Florida. He decided, well, I'm going to challenge it. And he brought it in front of court after court after court. Because he was form shopping. And in the end, he lost. Gore began this pattern now, this pattern of challenging electoral outcomes. And now we're supposed to change the constitutional construct to accommodate the left. It wasn't enough that we gave them the power of the purse. It wasn't enough that Bob Corker, under consideration for Secretary of State, 
under Trump, gave them the treaty clause. It wasn't enough that we've hollowed out, in many respects, the Bill of Rights, the separation of powers, the Commerce Clause. That's not enough. Now to accommodate the left, in addition to the 17th Amendment direct election of senators, now they want direct election of presidents. Because they're populists, not little R Republicans. When we want to come back, I want to explain to you from a different angle. I've hit this over and over and over again, but from a different angle, why this is an extremely dangerous effort. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Calling all gun enthusiasts, I have an opportunity for you to get a brand new gun for free. So listen closely. You see, the United States Concealed Carry Association educates, trains, and ensures responsible gun owners just like you and me, which is why they're giving five lucky listeners $1,600 to buy their own elite gun. It's a lot of money. You could pick just about any gun off the store shelf. Maybe you're in the market for a Remington Tactical or Smith & Wesson or even a Sig Sauer 1911. Hmm, that sounds cool. Just visit DefendThem.com. Pick out your favorite. DefendThem.com. And in case that wasn't enough to whet your gun-loving appetite, I'll let you in on the extra bonus prize. 95 runners-up will win a limited-edition USCCA range bag with iron ear protection worth 115 bucks. So talk about having the odds in your favorite. That's 100 chances to win. But like any other exclusive deal, this one isn't going to last. So secure your free entry now at DefendThem.com. That's DefendThem.com. Electoral College. Then we're going to move on next hour, but this is an attack. This is an effort. George Soros uh, financed Hillary Clinton's recount lawyer, Mark Elias. is a great piece by Aaron Klein on Breitbart on this. But Michael Newton over what would the founders think? Many today want to get rid of the Electoral College method. The Founding Fathers considered, debated, and voted on different methods of choosing a president during the Constitutional Convention in 1787. Deciding how to select or elect the president was one of the most difficult decisions the Founders had to make during the Constitutional Convention. They held at least 16 votes on this one issue. The options they considered included selection by state legislators, selection by the national legislature, and an electoral system. They even considered direct election of the president, as many today propose, but rejected the idea. It was brought up for a vote twice at the convention and was rejected by a 9-to-1 vote on July 17 and by a 9-to-2 vote on August 24. These were committees. Each state got one vote. The founders framed the Constitution so that each public official was selected by a different method. Representatives are democratically elected by their districts. Up until 1913, senators were chosen by the state legislatures. Today, of course, senators are elected uh, by whole states. Supreme Court justices are chosen by the president and confirmed by the Senate. They serve for life and thus are the most independent of public opinion. Representatives up for re-election every two years are most dependent on public opinion. Senators serving every six years are somewhat dependent on the public, but less so than representatives who run for re-election more often and have a smaller constituency. Last, the president is chosen for a four-year term through the Electoral College system. Though the specific methodology of the Electoral College has changed through the years, most notably after the 1800 election, when we have the 12th Amendment, had it's always been an indirect method of choosing our president. Thus, we have four different methods of choosing our public officials, and each public official serves for a different length of time. So this makes it virtually impossible for any party, faction, region, or socioeconomic group to gain power throughout government, exactly what our founding fathers intended, and exactly what the progressive status left hates. Over the last hundred years, the U.S. has become more democratic. States and local governments added ballot propositions, giving the people a means of bypassing the legislature and governor to pass veto-proof legislation with a simple majority. The 17th Amendment provided for direct election of senators. 
Political parties used to choose their nominees, but states started moving to primary elections about 100 years ago. Now the people, instead of the parties, choose their nominees. The people's opinion gained even more strength with the advent of modern polling. Now all these moves toward democracy are bad. Many, if not most, would argue that allowing the people to choose a party's nominee is better than having party bosses do so. But overall, the trend toward democracy as opposed to republicanism has weakened the systems of checks and balances our founders established. The founders were very wary of democracy and not republicanism. Democracy, and rightly so. Madison, Federalist 10. Democracies have ever been spectacles of turbulence and contention, have ever been found incompatible with personal security or the rights of property, and have in general been as short in their lives as they have been violent in their deaths. Moving to a direct election of president would be another step toward democracy, another step away from republicanism in our system of checks and balances. The Founding Fathers considered direct election of presidents and twice rejected it by overwhelming margins. The Founders set up our delicate system of choosing elected officials, including the Electoral College, much study and debate with full knowledge of its strengths and weaknesses, with only minor modifications over the past over 200 years. This system has served the nation extremely well. We need checks and balances. We need a Republican system, not a direct democracy. The status progressives always argue for a direct democracy. You want to know why? Because they believe in mobocracy. You want to know why else? Because they dress their centralized totalitarianism as a for-the-people enterprise, whether it's Cuba or North Korea or whether it's some left-wing kook group like now trying a coup d'etat to fight Trump and install Hillary Clinton. I'll be right back. He's here. He's here. Now broadcasting from the underground command post. Deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Hello, everybody. Mark Levin here. Our number, 877-381-3811, 877-381-3811. This is from my Julie. Donald Trump has commended more law enforcement officers in one day than Obama has in eight years. That's true, don't you think, Rich? All right. As you know, this is rather a renaissance show. We move around news philosophy, history, economics, politics, whatever. I want you to listen to this. This is one of the great minds. And there have been many in world history. But this is one of my favorites. You've heard me talk about him many, many, many times. He appears in almost all my books. And his name is Alexis de Tocqueville. Now, he lived from 1805 to 1859. And he was greatly influenced by Montesquieu, who influenced our constitutional founders a great deal. So he wrote two volumes, which is Democracy in America. He wrote one volume in 1835, and the second one was in 1840. And it was based on his travels in America and his observations. I want you to listen to this, because I want you to keep in mind the Obama administration is now pushing out the door hundreds of regulations. And think about what's been going on in this country for decades in terms of regulations and smothering individual initiative and so forth and so on. Just listen to this man. Democratic governments may become violent and even cruel at certain periods of extreme effervescence or of great danger. But these crises will be rare and brief. When I consider the petty passions of our contemporaries, the mildness of their manners, the extent of their education, the purity of their religion, the gentleness of their morality, their regular and industrious habits, and the restraint which they almost all observe in their vices, no less than in their virtues, I have no fear that they will meet tyrants in their rulers, but rather 
with their guardians. So it's not that we'll have tyrants as rulers, we'll have guardians. I think then that the species of oppression by which democratic nations are menaced is unlike anything that ever before existed in the world. Our contemporaries will find no prototype of it in their memories. I seek in vain for an expression that will accurately convey the whole of the idea I have formed of it. The old words despotism and tyranny are inappropriate. The thing itself is new. He's talking about what envelops a democracy. And since I cannot name it, I must attempt to define it. He says, I seek to trace the novel features under which despotism may appear in the world. The first thing that strikes the observation is an innumerable multitude of men, all equal and alike, incessantly endeavoring to procure the petty and paltry pleasures with which they glut their lives. Each of them living apart is a stranger to the fate of all the rest. His children and his private friends constitute to him the whole of mankind. As for the rest of his fellow citizens, he's close to them, but he does not see them. He touches them, but he does not feel them. He exists only in himself and for himself alone. And if this kindred still remain to him, he may be said at any rate to have lost his country. Now this is the key. Above this race of men stands an immense and tutelary power, which takes upon itself alone to secure their gratifications and to watch over their fate. That power is absolute, minute, regular, provident, and mild. It would be like the authority of a parent if, like the authority, its object was to prepare men for manhood. But it seeks, on the contrary, to keep them in perpetual childhood. It is well content that the people should rejoice provided they think of nothing but rejoicing. For their happiness, such a government willingly labors, but it chooses to be the sole agent and the only arbiter of their happiness. <coughs> it provides for their security, foresees and supplies their necessities, facilitates their pleasures, manages their principal concerns, directs their industry, regulates the descent of property, and subdivides their inheritances. What remains but to spare them all the care of thinking, and all the trouble of living. Thus, it every day renders the exercise of the free agency of man less useful and less frequent, circumscribes the will within a narrowest range, and gradually robs a man of all the uses of himself. The principle of equality has prepared men for these things. It has predisposed men to endure them and often to look on them as benefits. I'm not done. Pretty remarkable, don't you think? After having thus successfully taken each member of the community in its powerful grasp and fashioned him at will, the supreme power then extends its arm over the whole community. It covers the surface of society with a network of small, complicated rules, minute and uniform, through which the most original minds and the most energetic characters cannot penetrate to rise above the crowd. The will of a man is not shattered, but softened, bent, and guided. Men are seldom forced by it to act, but they are constantly restrained from acting. Such a power does not destroy, but prevents existence. It does not tyrannize, but it compresses, enervates, extinguishes, and stupefies a people till each nation is reduced to nothing better than a flock of timid and industrial, industrious animals of which the government is the shepherd." I have always thought that servitude of the regular, quiet, and gentle kind, which I have just described, might be combined more easily than is commonly believed with some of the outward forms of freedom, and that it might even establish itself under the wing of the sovereignty of the people. Our contemporaries are constantly excited by two conflicting passions. They want to lead, and they wish to remain free. As they cannot destroy either, the one or the other, the one or the other of these contrary propensities, they strive to satisfy them both at once. They devise a sole, tutelary, and all-powerful form of government, but elected by, this is key, but elected by the people. They devise a sole, tutelary, and all-powerful form of government, but elected by the people. They combine the principle of centralization and that of popular sovereignty. This gives them a respite. They console themselves for being in tutelage, by the reflection that they have chosen their own guardians. 
Every man allows himself to put in leading strings, to be put in leading strings, because he sees that it is not a person or a class of persons, but the people at large who hold the end of his chain. By this system, the people shake off their state of dependence just long enough to select their master and then relapse into it again. You see, ladies and gentlemen, you and I have been talking about this for years. For years. Forget about the plagiarists and the propagandists and the copycats on TV and radio. Just listen to me for a moment. What Alexis Satokfil is saying, what I cited in the Liberty and Tyranny ten years ago, what I cited in Ameritopia two or three years later, what we've talked about here many, many times, as I've read that passage to you many, many times, is that on the one hand, that's why I'm talking about the Electoral College, the coup against Trump and all the rest of it, on the one hand, we have this massive administrative state pushing out thousands of regulations a year. Obama's using it to push out hundreds of regulations after the election, before he leaves office, to smother our independence, to make it more difficult for us to be unique human beings, to force upon us uniformity and conformity, because we are nothing more than servants of the state rather than the other way around. That's how the status progressive views us. Obama, Hillary and in a more aggressive and totalitarian form, Castro and the rest. And yet we go to the ballot. We go to the precinct and we cast a ballot. Every two years for the House, a certain number of years, depending on when your senator's up, your president of the United States, we vote. Popular election, however the, we know about the Electoral College. And his point is, and his point is brilliant, these are motions, in many respects, that we go through. Because increasingly we are governed by this thing, this blob, which is getting bigger and bigger and more ubiquitous and more powerful with every passing day. With every passing day. And more and more, there's nothing we can do about it. Nothing we can do about it at the ballot box. We can slow it down, maybe get a short respite, as we did with Reagan, as hopefully we will with Trump. But we do not stop it. We do not reverse course. So his point is we cease to be independent thinking, viable, successful individuals, which is exactly what the statist wants. Exactly. And yet they claim to want us to get an education. They don't want us to get an education. They want us to be indoctrinated. They want us to be indoctrinated. That's why so many colleges and universities are populated with tenured professors of the radical left, Marxists among others, with hate America professors and so forth. And it's not just in our universities and colleges, many of our public school systems. You're taught to hate America, you're taught to hate the founders. You're taught to hate the Declaration and the Constitution. You're taught to think about things in a new way. And the only way you can get liberation, I've thought about this a lot, is through government. That's how they sell freedom. Now some backbencher will pick this up, just as they picked up Alexis de Tocqueville in my books. Just as they scour my books, and they regurgitate what I say. This is one of the really bad aspects of this business. It just truly is. There's not a damn thing I can do about it. But I think it's important, particularly in this context. Here we have an article. Where is this from? This is from PJ Media, citing Politico, among other things. Obama to push nearly 100 new regulations before leaving office. And several of them have an economic impact of over $100 million. And it covers everything. It covers everything. These are massive regulations. He does not have the authority to do this. The bureaucracy does not have the authority to do this. He's going to do it against the wishes of Congress. Leaders, the Republican leaders of Congress have written the administration, have told him to cut it out, but he won't cut it out. 
In fact, the EPA administrator said, quote, as I've mentioned to you before, writing to her uh, employees, we're running, not walking through the finish line of President Obama's presidency. Thank you for taking the run with me. I'm looking forward to all the progress that still lies ahead. Let me ask you folks something. Other than those of you who are lobbyists or lawyers who, who work on these areas of regulation and so forth, those of you who don't, do you have any idea what any of these 100 regulations say? Any idea whatsoever? Did you have a real opportunity to comment on any of them? Did your member of Congress? You know they have the force of law. You know they can shut down businesses. You know they can destroy businesses. They can shut down assembly lines, shut down smokestack industries. The EPA has done a fine job already of destroying the coal industry. Would like to steal all these smokestack industries or destroy all of them. The reason Carrier said it needs to get the hell out of here and go somewhere else has nothing to do with labor costs and everything to do with the EPA. It has to keep changing its technology. It's manufacturing air conditioners. But the left hates progress. It hates capitalism. It hates civility. You know, capitalism and constitutionalism and individualism, they go hand in hand. One needs the other and the other. That's the way it works in a free society. So remember what Alexis de Tocqueville said. We've talked about it many times. It's been included in many of my books. We're reaching a point in this country where we are so overwhelmed uh, with federal rules and directives and fiats and regulations, so overwhelmed with being bullied and pushed around and so forth and so on, so distant from the ability to influence what actually goes on in Washington through these bureaucracies and two million army strong, that yes, we vote. And it's still important that we vote. But more and more the vote has little or nothing to do with the outcome. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Now, the, uh, the Islamo-Nazi who was killed at Ohio State after running down a bunch of students uh, and getting out of his car with a butcher's knife and attacking them, one I believe is in critical condition as I speak, was shot dead by a uh, heroic officer, campus officer at Ohio State University. And our friend Paul Bedard at the Washington Examiner writes, the Obama administration resettled 8,858 Somali refugees in the United States last year, and nearly 43,000 during Obama's eight years. I just checked, there's 10.5 million people in that country. Nearly 43,000 during Obama's eight years. That's a huge number that is now raising concerns after the Somali refugee led a one-man attack spree on the campus at Ohio State. Like Syrian refugees, there's no adequate way to check the backgrounds of the Somalis, according to the head of the Center for Immigration Studies, Kerkorian. The Somali refugee numbers into the U.S. from the Department of Homeland Security and State as follows. 8,858 in 2015, 9,000 in 2014, 7,608 in 2013, 4,911 in 2012, 3,161 in 2011, 4,884 in 2010, 4,189 in 2009. Some 97,000 Somali refugees have been resettled in the United States since 9-11. Of those, 99.6% were Muslim. 29.7% were males between the ages of 14 and 50. In a review of the numbers, 
CSI Executive Director Mark Kikorian said, We have no way of vetting people from any of the failed states of the Islamic world, whether Somalia or Libya or Yemen or Afghanistan or Iraq. The latter two, actually, we have more intelligence on, having ruled them for a number of years, but even that information is of limited use. We admitted two Iraqis as refugees who, we only discovered later, had been improvised explosive device makers back in Iraq, and the FBI fears dozens more such terrorists have been admitted as refugees. Well, then, I hope the very extreme vetting will uh, kick into place when the president-elect becomes president of the United States. I'm all for very extreme vetting. But I've also been the one for, to say for years, how do you vet people from Syria? Or in this case, Somalia and so forth. When they have no civil society. You don't just hit a database on some computer system. They don't exist. I'll be right back. Levin, America's think tank. And you can call him at 877-381-3811. A recent fund manager believes that every investor should have a formal allocation of physical gold to enhance the liquidity of their portfolio. Now that's what central banks understand, which is why they all own gold. Times of political and economic uncertainty, shouldn't you consider the safe haven asset chosen by fund managers and central banks. I don't even need fund managers and central banks to tell me this. I have gold. Now, you don't need to overdo it. Just part of your portfolio like anything else so you can diversify. And that's what I've done. Now is the time to learn the benefits of owning gold. The only gold company I trust is Goldline. Call Goldline. Get their free information and learn how easy it is to add physical gold to your portfolio or IRA. The number is 877-365-COIN. And Goldline lets you buy with confidence with its price protection programs on qualifying purchases. 877-365-COIN. Goldline has been helping people buy gold for more than 55 years. They have a five-star trust pilot rating from thousands of verified clients. You read Goldline's support and risk information. See if buying gold is right for you. It's right for me. That's why I did it. That's why I do it. That's called diversifying. Their number is 877-365-COIN, 877-365-COIN. Even though we've had a new election, even though we're going to have a new president, that mass of debt just keeps piling up and piling up and piling up. And nobody, and I mean nobody's talking about it. Nobody's talking about what to do about it. So that's very, very serious, in my humble opinion. So here I am now for the third time, maybe, having to address the potential, or at least the possibility, that Donald Trump will select Bob Corker, the junior senator from Tennessee, as America's Secretary of State. He's meeting with him again tomorrow. Everybody's talking about Mitt Romney. Sixty million of you voted for Mitt Romney. I voted for Mitt Romney. I don't support Mitt Romney. The man who ought to be in that job is John Bolton. Now, that said, Bob Corker, on the list of names that's floating around, is the absolute worst. The absolute worst. And I'm going to tell you why. At least Mitt Romney didn't do severe damage to our Constitution. I'm not carrying the ball for Mitt Romney. I don't care for Mitt Romney. I told you who I'd like to see. But let's address this one more time. And I'm really stunned that President-elect Donald Trump is considering Bob Corker for Secretary of State as I speak. He's going to meet with him tomorrow. And I'm told Bob Corker is being pushed by his son-in-law again, Jared, what is it, Kushner? I would know Jared Kushner from Jared the Subway Sandwich Guy, quite frankly. So this Jared Kushner is Ivanka Trump's husband. He's a liberal Democrat. 
He's 35 years old. All of a sudden, he's the Svengali with the strings. Well, we'll have to keep an eye on the young man, won't we? But it's up to Donald Trump. And I would say that I think this Romney thing is a bit of a distraction. Maybe he will pick Romney. I don't know. But the man who did actual direct damage to our constitutional system is named Bob Corker. And I cannot believe that he's under consideration by Donald Trump for anything, even Postmaster General. I can't believe it. The treaty clause in the Constitution has a specific purpose with very plain language that even Bob Corker could understand. When you propose to enter into a significant deal with one or more other countries, you must submit that to the United States Senate, which can either ratify or not by two-thirds of the senators present. The reason is to ensure that the body politic, that's you and me, know what's in the deal before the deal is put in place. Hamilton in the Federalist Papers couldn't have been clear about this. The liberals love Hamilton. They do plays on Hamilton. What they won't listen to Hamilton. He argued, and decisively so. We cannot have one man, a president of the United States, bind the entire nation to another nation or to an international agreement without more than that one individual looking at it. And Bob Corker did worse. He not only cut a deal with Obama, but he turned the provision on its head, where we actually needed a filibuster-proof Senate to stop Obama from doing this deal. And Donald Trump is considering Bob Corker for Secretary of State? Oh, I'm not done. Not only did he gut the treaty clause of the Constitution to accommodate Barack Obama, what was it that he was accommodating? The Iran nuclear deal. Bob Corker gutted the treaty clause of the Constitution with the President of the United States to prevent the United States Senate from voting down that Iran deal. Voting it down and killing it. The $150 billion released to the Islamo-Nazi regime in Tehran. Now we know of all these side deals. If it had been treated as a treaty and gone to the United States Senate, he would have been forced to show us all the side deals. But instead he cut his side deals. Instead the Senate tied its own hands. The Republican majority in the Senate, led in this case by Bob Corker, who Donald Trump is considering for Secretary of State. I have to hear this Romney crap all day. You all better pay attention to Corker. For the third or fourth time now. I'm concerned about Trump's judgment. Or the judgment of his son-in-law. And the others who are pushing this. Do they not realize that this Iran deal, which endangers your children and grandchildren which will ensure that the Islamo-Nazis in Tehran have nuclear warheads on ICBMs in 10 or 12 years, that Bob Corker, in part, is responsible for this. Do they not understand that? Secretary of State? Are you kidding me? No. Instead, we're told John Bolton is too much of a hawk. He's a neoconservative. He's too much of a hawk. Well, John Bolton didn't arm the Islamo-Nazi regime in Iran. Corker helped arm them. You want to talk about a hawk? He's the hawk. Now, we can do a hell of a lot better than this. And I shouldn't have to keep getting behind the microphone and talking about this. This is stupid. It's idiotic. It's dangerous. Putting a man of such low intelligence... Who doesn't comprehend the world scene? Who helped Obama arm up the Iranians? 
Now, you might say to yourselves, if you're really on the ball, or if you're a left-wing professor trying to trick me, you might say to yourselves, well, Mark, how can the Senate vote on the deal if Obama didn't submit it as a treaty? Is that required under the treaty clause? That the Senate has to sit around and beg the President of the United States to submit some agreement, some deal to the Senate? Is that what it says? That's not what it says. The minute this deal, quote-unquote, was made public, or parts of it were made public, Mitch McConnell should have taken it, brought it before the United States Senate, voted on it as a treaty, and killed it. That's what he should have done. There's nothing in the Constitution that prevents the Senate from doing that. In fact, the Senate would be reasserting, for once, its power to participate in this process, not as handmaidens, but as muscular representatives of the people. You don't like that Iran deal? It's not just Obama's fault. It's Corker's fault, too. And you know who pushed him out front? Mitch McConnell. You know who's pushing Corker? Jared, what's his name? Seriously. Kutchner. Kushner. The 35-year-old liberal Democrat who happens to be Trump's son-in-law. Well, he must know. He's so sharp. Has anybody ever heard the man speak? Mr. Bidu, do we even have any audio of him? I don't think he ever speaks. Well, get out of the shadows, young man. If you're going to start rearranging our government, you're going to have this kind of influence and defend what you're doing. You know who else likes Corker, Mr. Producer? Mitch McConnell's pushing Corker. You know who else is pushing Corker, Mr. Producer? Rince Priebus. Now, I can understand Newt Gingrich, and what's the chubby guy's name? I can't remember. From Arkansas. Oh, Huckabee. Going all over Fox, attacking Romney. I can understand it. Romney bested both of those guys. I understand. Romney made a horrific speech about Trump. I got all that. But they're silent on Corker. It's a disgrace. Conservatives, nationalists, populists, constitutionalists, agrarians, metrosexuals, bisexuals, no sexuals, should all be standing up. Well, some should sit down. But should be denouncing this. Should be denouncing this. If, in fact, Corker is chosen, it would be the worst presidential pick by a Republican in my lifetime. Absolutely the worst in such a position. It'd be a disgrace. So we're going to need to keep our eye on this one. This Corker pops up again, again, like a bad rash. There he is. All the little conservative media types aren't saying anything. All the little websites aren't saying, oh, all of that, nothing. Now, oh, let's talk Romney, Romney. Let's talk about Romney. You're going to talk about Romney? Good. They'll push over Romney over there at the State Department. He's a happy face. He'll be the CEO. All the munchkins under him will chew him up and spit him out. I got that. Corker affirmatively, ladies and gentlemen, damaged our Constitution and helped Obama put in place a deal that will arm up our enemy with nukes. That's unacceptable. A fool in the United States Senate should not be rewarded with a Secretary of State position where he can travel the world and show that he's a fool to everybody else. He'll be viewed as a pushover because he is. And I will go to war over this, should he be nominated. And I hope you'll join me. We may well lose, but we'll do this for country and family. I'll be right back. Mark Levin. I 
understand. The man has the whole world to choose from. And tomorrow he's meeting with Romney and Corker. What, what is that all about? Is that not bizarre? Yes, it's bizarre. The one guy who gave a speech, which was the most deranged smear job I've heard in a long time, and the other guy who took out a, uh, a pair of scissors and cut the hell out of the Constitution. And now our enemy, Iran, they're going to get nukes. They're going to get ICBMs. And this guy washes his hands, Corker, and he pretends he had nothing to do with it. He had everything to do with it. That jerk. I'm sick of these Republicans getting away with this stuff. It's one thing not to stand up to Obama, but to kiss his feet. What the hell is that? He can't stand up to Obama. How the hell is he going to stand up to the Chinese and the Russians and the third world banana republics? It's absolutely unbelievable to me. Oh, he's coming back for another interview. Interview for what? For crying out loud. Quirker? Might as well interview Susan Collins. What the hell? Interview Susan Collins. I have a better idea. Get that Mark Kirk who just lost in Illinois. Make him Secretary of State. Then you can make Susan Collins Secretary of Defense. Why not? It's bizarre. Stupid. Now, ladies and gentlemen, how many wrinkles did this election season honestly add to your appearance? It's obviously added a lot to the other side. Well, with this Esotique XV holiday blowout, treat yourself to the best, most effective wrinkle treatment money can buy. My mom uses it. Other family members use it. I have a buddy who uses it. They love it. But what about folks like you in my audience? Here's Sheila from Alturas, California. I was sent two small samples of Esotique XV. I used every drop in just two days, saw so noticeable reduction in the appearance of wrinkles around the mouth, and lower jawline. I'm definitely ordering this product. Now, folks, you'll look years younger and get silky smooth skin or your money back. No questions asked. Hello, your money back. No questions asked. Call 800-SKIN-604, 800-SKIN-604. But wait, for this holiday season, order Esotique XV and get the Genesel bags and puffiness treatment and the best-selling deep firming serum absolutely free with your order. Call now, and shipping is also free. I would act immediately. 800-SKIN-604. That's three free gifts for trying Esotique XV today. You'll be absolutely amazed or your money back. So don't wait. Call 800-SKIN-604. That's 800-SKIN-604. All right. Let me see if I can pull up the call screen here. What? Holy mackerel. There it is. Let us go to Ashley, Los Angeles, California, 870 AM, The Answer, our great affiliate there. How may I help you? Good evening, Mark. Love your show. Always Thank listen. You. Um, Thank you. I'm very concerned about the Democrats contesting the election results for Trump. And the reason why is because we know they will stop it. They won't stop at anything to get their way. And our more recent election or the election uh, results of Norm Coleman, the senator from Minnesota, where they found some ballots in someone's trunk after the election. Oh, yes, yes. They gave us the uh, the former Cokehead comic. Right, exactly. The former. All right, let me, let me tell you the difference here. If there's a dispute, in the end, it winds up in a joint uh, session of Congress. And under our Constitution, uh, in addition to the 12th Amendment added to it, um, the it goes to the House of Representatives to select the president and to the Senate to select the vice president. In the House, they vote uh, one vote per state delegation. The Republicans have a majority of the state delegations in the House. In the Senate for vice president, it's a majority vote. The Republicans have a majority. So let me just, you know, uh, let you all know that despite the attempt at this coup, this coup attempt, these people are trying to damage Trump and his mandate and damage our republic. But the Constitution's brilliance 
Trump will be President of the United States in the end, no matter what. And Pence will be Vice President of the United States in the end. Does that make you feel a little better? A little bit, but my bigger concern, frankly, is that this is a distraction and a delay. And the long, last time we had such a presidential contested election, it was Gore and Bush. And it wasn't shortly after Bush got into office that we had 9-11. All right. Well, you're right. You're right about that. I'll be right back. He's here. He's here. Now broadcasting from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. No talking points here. Call them as we see them, folks. I'll never leave you, lead you astray. I am Mark Levin. Our number, 877-381-3811. 877-381-3811. Well, there's a fellow by the name of Stephen Moore. Pops up on TV and radio everywhere. He's had a lot of jobs, too, including working partly in the Reagan administration. And the Hill newspaper reported that... Uh, he was talking to Republican lawmakers, I believe in the House, a closed-door whip meeting. Does that mean they took out the whips and they're whipping each other, Mr. Producer? It's not some of that, uh, what do they call that? Well, whatever. S&M stuff going on in the Republican caucus, I hope not. Um, Donald Trump's economic advisor, Stephen Moore, who used to be with Cato, who used to be with Heritage, who used to be, used to be, told a group of top Republicans last week that they now belong to a fundamentally different political party. Moore surprised some of the Republican lawmakers assembled at their closed-door whip meeting when he told them that they should no longer think of themselves as belonging to the conservative party of Ronald Reagan. They now belong to Trump's populist working-class party, he said. Almost sounds communist. Oh, I'm in a worker. I'm in a populist working-class party. How about just an American party? A source briefed on the House GOP whip meeting, which Moore attended as a guest of Majority Whip Steve Scalise, said several lawmakers told him they were taken aback by the economist's comments. For God's sake, it's Stephen Moore, the source said. He's the guy who started Club for Growth. He's Mr. Su Supply Side Economics. I think it's going to take them a little time to process what this all means, the source added. The vast majority of them were on the wrong side. They didn't think this was going to happen and so forth and so on. Well, there's been a reply. There have been several replies, actually. All of them excellent. But there's been a reply of recent vintage, I'd say, in the last ten minutes. By the director of the executive director of the Ronald Reagan Library and Foundation, John Highbush, and our friend uh, Craig Shirley, a Reagan uh, historian. Quintessential, outstanding Reagan historian and a personal friend. They're both personal friends. And I think this needs to be responded to also. I mean, first of all, have you ever heard of apparatchiks? And that's what he is. He was in the Reagan administration. Now he wants to work for Trump. He bounces around. My, my only point is it's nothing personal. I'm not, I don't dislike the man. I barely know the man. But would the Democrats ever put down one of the most successful Democrat presidents in American history? Would they say this is no longer the party of FDR? It's the party of Obama? Or it's no longer the party of Kennedy or Truman, it's the party of Clinton. They don't talk like this. It's disrespectful. It sounds, you know, ridiculous. <clears throat> you even have some big mouth radio hosts, former leftists. Forget about Reagan already. Where's my meatballs? Anyway, here's what they write at Conservative Review. The great conservative review website, where I must confess I'm editor-in-chief, but our man Gaston Mooney holds down the fort. Donald Trump has not even been sworn in as the 45th president, and yet Trump booster Steve Moore, former columnist for the Wall Street Journal, and former a lot of things, apparently told a group of House Republicans last week they're no longer, uh, they are no longer Ronald Reagan's party. Interesting. 
Steve Moore would have us bury Ronald Reagan a second time. This before the Trump presidency has even begun. Let's see where we are eight years before we start making baseless proclamations. Moore's commentary notwithstanding, history has already passed judgment on Ronald Reagan. And not just on his presidency, but on his entire life. Reagan actually won big majorities of the popular vote and vast majorities of the Electoral College in 1980 and 84. And he left office with an astonishing approval rating of over 70%. Did so because he had a clear philosophy. Less taxes, less regulation, smaller government, more freedom, and a strong defense. He created 19 million new jobs. He righted and inspired a nation. He toppled an evil, an evil empire, freeing tens of millions. He was and remains a consequential president and world leader. So we got curious about the matter, they write, so commissioned the respected pollster John McLaughlin to recently ask Republicans nationwide about President Reagan in the day and age of the Trump phenomena. By a margin of 58% to 25%, Republicans saw Trump as different from Reagan, not similar. When asked if Trump would be as successful as Reagan, by a margin of 48% to 33%, Republicans did not think Trump would be as successful as the Gipper. There are thousands of sites, monuments, buildings, roads, all manner of things in America named after Reagan by a grateful nation. Maybe someday Trump will be as revered as much as Reagan. But let's not be hasty to belittle the relevance of Ronald Reagan and the Reagan Revolution. Even in the cause of serving one's job hunt, more a frequent cable talking head, ironically once got a job in Washington because of Ronald Reagan. American conservatism, American populism, American libertarianism are all closely related, they write. These isms don't completely overlap, but they are often based upon the rights and dignity and privacy of the free individual. Might surprise Stephen Moore and others who misunderstood Reagan's message when he said in 1975, quote, In my opinion, the root of these problems lies right here in Washington, D.C. Our nation's capital has become the seat of a buddy system that functions for its own benefit increasingly insensitive to the needs of the American worker who supports it with his taxes. This is Reagan. Today it's difficult to find leaders who are independent of the forces that have brought us our problems. The Congress, the bureaucracy, the lobbyists, big business, and big labor. If America is to move forward, this must change. Quote, unquote, Reagan. Look at Reagan named bigness as what threatened an, uh, an ailed America. Bigness is the enemy of individualism. Continuing, the Midwest populist, I wouldn't call him just a populist. I would say the Midwest populist conservative, Reagan, said, In the coming months, I will take this message to the American people. I will talk in detail about responsible, responsive government. I will tell the people it is they who should decide how much government they want. Unquote. What could be more American conservative, more American populist, than this statement announcing his candidacy for president? One further evidence, in an address to the California Republican State Central Committee Convention in September 73, Reagan said this, One legislator accused me of having a 19th century attitude on law and order. That is a totally false charge. I have an 18th century attitude. That is when the Founding Fathers made it clear that the safety of law-abiding citizens should be one of the government's primary concerns, unquote. It was an era in which the thinking of John Locke and Thomas Jefferson who believed in the natural, God-given rights of the individual, prevailed. Reagan was the quintessential American conservative. Stephen Moore said Trump has made the GOP into a blue-collar party, but surely he's heard of the Reagan Democrat. In 1980 alone, Reagan won 25% of the Democratic vote nationwide, all blue-collar, taking the party away from the country club elitism of Nelson Rockefeller and George Romney. Reagan railed against the corporate boardroom, country club image of the Republican Party, and through his rhetoric and policies, remade the Republican Party. Now, we don't see a strong Reagan-like mandate, mandate for President-elect Trump right now. The election was much a rejection of Hillary Clinton. There's nothing similar to a mandate for a Reagan revolution. The vote in 1980 was clearly an overwhelming electoral landslide, popular and electoral college, for Reagan and his ideas. Post-election polling showed a rejection of Jimmy Carter and an affirmation for Reagan's new federalism. 
There's nothing like that from Trump right now except the chant to drain the swamp, a worthy goal which we applaud and support. Historically, inexorably, America has been moving to the right since the end of the New Deal. Each Democrat has become more conservative. Each Republican has become more conservative. A great part of that impetus, which led to the GOP holding a record number of elective seats nationwide, came from Reaganism, and still does. Barack Obama was simply a detour in history, an aberration, whose presidency could soon be lost in the sands of time like Rutherford B. Hayes and Millard Fillmore. Meanwhile, the party of Reagan is the party of Reagan. <clears throat> what underlies their point here is that Reagan stood for things that stand the test of time. Individualism, meaning individual sovereignty. Private property rights, meaning free market capitalism. A secure nation, meaning a strong defense, the strongest defense possible. Reagan believed in the American heritage, and the reason so many of us revere him is because so few presidents, so few presidential candidates, so few members of Congress do. Reagan understood the enemy, foreign and domestic. He was a liberal Democrat in the Hollywood. And then he spent years, decades, building the conservative movement to take on the Republican establishment. It was not a Johnny come lately. He helped forge and force this movement and helped it succeed. But he also was a long ball player. He could see down the road. If you're not successful one year, he come back the next. He didn't become the nominee until his third try. But the point is, what Stephen Moore is doing is, is quite outrageous. This is a man who was a libertarian, then a conservative, and now a populist. I am a constitutional conservative, ladies and gentlemen. That means I embrace the Declaration of Independence like you do. And I embrace the limits placed on government to try and prevent centralized tyranny in this country, as you see all over the world. I'm a believer in individual liberty, not in groupthink, not in quote-unquote group liberty. There cannot be a group liberty. We're individuals. We're human beings. Our system is very different than every other system on the face of the earth. It truly was an experiment. We didn't have a history of feudalism. We didn't have a history of, of a ruling monarchy in this country. We didn't have all the baggage that Europe had, or the third world as we call it today, had. We really were a blank slate. And John Locke's brilliance, one of the great thinkers of the Enlightenment, when he was asked about where is, where, where is this place of unalienable rights? Where is this place of, of God-given natural law and natural rights, respect for the individual? Where is this place? He said America is that place. He specifically said America is that place. Before we had our independence, before we had a declaration, before we had a constitution, we had colonies. He said, look over there. Reagan knew that and understood that. Reagan read all about John Locke and Thomas Paine and Edmund Burke and Charles de Montesquieu and Adam Smith and Bastiat. All these books were on his shelves at home with cornered pages, with worn pages. One of the most well-read presidents in American history, despite the attempts to attack his character and his intelligence. Reagan knew exactly what he wanted to do as president. I've said it before. Was he perfect? No. Of course not, he wasn't perfect. Is anybody perfect? But he was exceptional. Shame on you, Stephen Moore. Shame on the others who do exactly the same thing. 
You don't build up Trump by trashing Reagan. Just like you don't build up poor people by trashing rich people. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Let us go to Jorge Las Cruces, New Mexico, the great KTSM. Go! Uh, Mark, I'd like to start out by saying the great light of American history shined in the eye of Ronald Reagan. And because of that, we are now standing in the position that we are. And uh, when uh, Donald Trump decides who is going to represent us internationally, I hope he takes in consideration the idea that perhaps maybe uh, both of might not be best able to serve us because um, – and I hate to put it quite like this, his data ideas, and um, even though I might not be as enthusiastic his what? for Kroger. His what? His what? His, his dated ideas. Oh, his dated ideas. Okay. Yeah. And um, can I continue? Yeah, that whole national security thing is very dated. No, I'm not speaking about national security being dated. I'm speaking about the idea that national security has fundamentally changed since the days when... Um, George Bush first came into office in National security has not fundamentally changed since the beginning of the Republic. Uh, you build up your military to protect the country. Uh, you have certain alliances. You need to be very careful about them in order to protect your country. And when you see the rise of an enemy, you address it. Okay. How has national security changed? Hello? I said, how has national security changed? No, he, no, he hung up. He wanted to tell me why Corker would be great as Secretary of State, so I, I don't know. I tried, but I, you know, if you're going to make certain assumptions, I need to ask some questions. There I was, all polite and everything. Rosario, Rye, New York, the great WABC, go. Oh God, thank you, thank you. I've been waiting forever. I love. I'm you. sorry. I love you, and I really want to tell you a little bit about my story. I am yes. a former um, Cuban. I mean, I was born over there, and I mm -hmm. was a witness to all of the infamy that Castro did and how he swindled us. And for that reason, okay, I, can, I am so upset and, ups, I mean, angry to see how most Americans are not educated to know what they are being swindled into. And all these leftists, and they're eating up this country that I de love so dearly, okay? A and I don't know how let me to... Let me just say, I'm not sure most Americans are buying this. It's the typical lib media. They haven't seen a dictator they haven't loved. Well, I don't know about that, uh, Mark, but I can tell you that... I At least he's in, dead and gone, finally. I, I, you know, uh, I've been... Praying forever for this man to now you got away. the stupid little brother he's in place then you got his kids you got Castro's offspring you know uh, that's the problem is this thing ever going to end well you know uh, what Americans listening today I want them to know is that they need to speak up and speak much more clearly and openly and and intensively as they did the day they voted that was just day number one the, the fight I knew was coming. I saw it from the beginning in 2008, and I tried to warn people, and they wouldn't believe me. They think that I am phobic about communism. And communism <laughs> is just simply a mask, just not like uh, not Nazis and all these other dictatorships. It's just power and control. You're exactly right, Rosario. I have to run. I very much appreciate your call. We'll be right back. You're listening to Denali, the great one. The great one. And you can call in now, 877-381-3811. Now, this holiday season, you can check home security off your to-do list. Protect your home with my friends at Simply Safe Home Security. 
Now's the perfect time to do it. Simply Safe is having its biggest holiday sale ever. Right now, you can take a whopping $200 off Simply Safe's special holiday security package. Now, this award winning alarm system has everything you need to protect your home. It does. An arsenal of 17 security sensors to secure each door and window. That's a panic button, a blaring extra siren, and a wireless connection to authorities and police dispatch. So your family, your home, everything in it stays safe around the clock. Usually the alarm system, the alarm system is $600. Right now, it's just $400. This is the biggest deal Simply Safe has ever offered. Plus, there's no long-term contract with Simply Safe, no installation costs, no hidden fees. And 24-7 professional security monitoring, just $14.99 a month. So check it out right now. Get your $200 off at simplysafemark.com. That's simplysafemark.com for $200 off your home security system, simplysafemark.com. Now, here's Bernie Sanders yesterday on CNN talking about uh, Castro and so forth, but he makes a point that I want to uh, dispute. Cut five, go. Is it appropriate for the leader of the free world to offer condolences of a brutal dictator who killed his own people as well as Americans? Well, I think what we have seen in the last number of years is an improved relationship between the United States of America and Cuba. The United States of America has relations with China. We've had relations with brutal dictatorships all over the Stop world. Stop right there. This is the point I wanted to make. So if we have relationships with China, then we should have relationships with every thugocracy, every genocidal maniac who controls a country? What kind of a policy is that? We have a relationship with China out of necessity. They have like a billion and a half people. They're building up their military and so forth and so on. That's why we have a relationship with China. We don't have a relationship with Cuba. We have a totally different history with Cuba including the missile crisis, including them nationalizing American businesses, things that are unique to our dealings with Cuba. But I hear this said of pseudo-conservatives and leftists as well. Well, we have a relationship with China. That apparently is the knee-jerk talking point. It's of no consequence whatsoever, none. Now, speaking of knee-jerk liberals, this Colin Kaepernick, has been made a symbol, almost an iconic symbol, for the left. The problem is they figured out what all the rest of us already knew. He's a moron with a negative IQ. I said he's a moron with a negative IQ. And the only reason I'm bringing him up is to, in order to tear him down. He's on a conference call with a reporter from Miami whose family fled Cuba. It's a little hard to understand at the beginning, but he was wearing a Fidel Castro shirt. He also had Malcolm X, but Fidel Castro. I'm no fan of Malcolm X either, by the way. Cut six, go. One thing that Fidel Castro did do is they have the highest literacy rate because they invest more in Let's their... stop right there. I've looked for this. How do we know they've had the highest literacy rate? Where does that come from? Does anybody know where that comes from? What, they send down the uh, scholastic test people uh, out of the United States to test their people? No, I don't think so. We have no idea about their literacy rate. None. And their health care system sucks. Everybody has it, and it sucks. Unless you're one of the ruling class or a tourist, or something of that sort. But that's it. The average person in Cuba earns 20 to $25 a month. They make it like it's some uh, paradise down there. Even the photos we're allowed to take. People don't have air conditioning. The automobiles they have look like a picture out of a 1950s movie. The people are treated like crap. The media is controlled by the government. Well, come to think of it. But anyway, there's no free speech, none of these things. But as I said at the top of the show, the left loves dictators. As long as the dictator 
can be said to be promoting income, in, uh, income equality. Of course, they don't want to live under any of them. They just view it as a spectacle, something to look at, like TV. They're not really involved in what goes on in Cuba. Hey, you know, and he's trying, and, you know, it's okay, you know. They shot people. Well, maybe they deserved it. They're kind of undermining the, you know, the nirvana there over there. Well, whatever. Go ahead. One thing that Fidel Castro did do is they have the highest literacy rate because they invest more in their education system than they do in our prison system, which we... Hey, idiot, idiot. Their whole country's a prison system. You moron. None of these clowns would live over there. You know, they visit it. You know, like they're on vacation. They'll spend a week there, and, they, uh, and they'll be used for publicity purposes. Oh, El Comandante. Oh. Uh. Anyway, uh, go ahead. Here, even though we're fully capable of doing that. He also did something that we do not do here. He broke up families. He took over a country again without any, you know, justice and without any elections. Uh, we do break up families here. That's what mass incarceration Oh, is. you schmuck. You're a disgrace. You disgust me. We break up families here? How does somebody born in this country, adopted by loving parents, a man who has fame and fortune, equality and liberty, hate his own country? It can't just be ignorance, can it? I think there's a gene out there for people like this. You're born in the greatest country in the face of the earth. It's a blessing. And you're so quick to denounce it. You're so quick to to talk glowingly of gulag countries, of police states. And then to suggest that we have the same thing, maybe this fool's not aware that over a million people have left that police island, have left that police state, trying to come, and many of them trying to come to the United States, putting their lives on the line. Dying in the open oceans. And this jerk. Worst thing he gets is a crotch itch. Go ahead. That was the foundation of slavery, so our country has been based on that as well as the genocide. Hey, idiot. Has it been based on slavery? Our country was never based on slavery. He may not be familiar with the Civil War. I don't put anything past this guy. Go ahead. Native Americans. Are you equating the breaking up of Cuban families with people going to jail in the United States of America? I'm equating the breaking up of families with breaking up of families. Oh, my goodness. Well, there you go. There you go. I want to thank the National Football League uh, for, uh, for its... Belief in free speech in the First Amendment, which has no application whatsoever to Mr. Dummy there. Because they're not the government. And maybe they should teach him a little Castro. And fire his butt. And tell him, okay, we're oppressing you now. You're fired. There is no First Amendment in the stadium. There's no government in the stadium. Now go to your worker's paradise and see if you can live off 20 or $25 a, a month. And go ahead and enjoy their, their learning institutions. And go ahead and, and enjoy their health care. It's got to be great. Because Castro never used it. Remember they called in the Spanish doctor? Apparently the, uh, the, the great Cuban doctors kind of mixed up the fecal matter and pushed it into his stomach or some something. Maybe actually they were trying to do it. Maybe they should get a Medal of Freedom. Uh, in any event, just trying to point out that, uh, I don't know. It's, it is so frustrating that there's so many stupid people in this country. I'm not talking about you. Stupid people like him. Peter, Sedona, Arizona, Sirius Satellite, go. Hey, yeah, so I was out in Cuba in 1983 on a USA wrestling team, wrestling against the Cubans, and we took off to go watch a movie. And when we were watching the movie, 15 minutes before the movie started, they showed Reagan and Hitler, of all things. It was, like, bizarre. It was like science fiction. And then they showed Fidel Castro wearing white gloves, shaking the hands 
of little girls after First Holy Communion. It's the honest truth, and I was wearing my big USA on the back of my jacket, you know, and I start telling folks, this is ridiculous. What, you know, what, what is this? And there, a couple guys were saying, hey, you know, you better be quiet, you know, uh, whatever. So I just, I just kept talking and talking, and I had all these people gathered around me, and they all wanted to, you know, like, know what I was saying. And I ended up getting even to know one of the cops there because one of the cops came by. It was really weird. But they showed it for 15 minutes, complete bizarre, you couldn't make it up yourself, weirdness about America and race. I, I think a lot of left in the leftists in the country. You heard uh, Kaepernick there. I think he'd sit through that and say, yes, that's true. I just think you and I, we regular Americans, that is, those of us who love this country, and by the way, people who love this country come in every shape and form. People who love this country come in every race and religion, have all kinds of genitalia or not. And the point is, we have a different mentality than the people on the left, the statist progressive left. They really do despise this country. And it is a sickness. It really is a terrible, terrible thing. Thank you for your call, my friend. Let's go to R.J. Modesto, California, the great KSFO. Go. Hey, Mr. Levin, how you doing? Doing well. How are you? I'm doing awesome. Still very stoked about uh, the election, even though that's not why I called. All right. I'm calling about, we uh, living about 15 minutes away from uh, where Mr. Kaepernick uh, went to high school and grew up. And around here, his new nickname is Capper Crap, because oh. we're, we were we were once proud of what he had accomplished, and now the, uh, the the locals around here would like to see him stick it where the sun doesn't shine, because of his un-American attitude. So he grew up in a nice suburb, right? Oh, very nice suburb, Turlock, California. Went to mm. the uh, newer high school in Turlock. A beautiful, uh, big. Nice high school. Then uh, our horrible country um, paid for his four-year education, and then our horrible country also pays him a hundred million dollars to throw incomplete passes. So mm -hmm. we're not real big on this guy anymore. No, nah, and you shouldn't be. All right, my friend. Thank you for your call. We'll be right back. Much lovin. Christmas music is back. Have you noticed? Of course you have. Hundreds of fake retail apps are popping up in the app store posing as well-known brands. Now, these apps try to get your credit card information or sensitive data, like your birth date and address. The holiday shopping season is here big time. Watch out for these apps by paying attention to red flags, like using improper English or no previous reviews. Identity theft is America's fastest-growing crime. It happens when thieves use your information to pretend that they're you. They can buy things on credit and liquidate your bank accounts. LifeLock scans hundreds of millions of transactions each second, every second. If they detect your information, they send you an alert. And then a U.S.-based agent will work to fix any of your problems. That's different than free credit monitoring, which only alerts you to changes in credit. No one can prevent all identity theft or monitor all transactions at all businesses. But LifeLock is the very best identity theft protection available anywhere. If you join right now, you'll get a special 15% discount. So go to LifeLock.com or call 1-800-457-LOCK. 1-800-457-5625. Use promo code LEVIN15. That's LEVIN15 to save 15%. Act now. The offer ends December 31. Call 1-800-457-LOCK, 1-800-5625. Use promo code LEVIN15, LEVIN15. Also, we've been hard at work at CRTV and LEVIN TV. So here's the thing. If you're a veteran or you're in the military presently, you can get a $30 discount 
while this discount lasts. By ordering uh, our uh, Conservative Review TV, you can give it as a gift. Now, if you're not in the military, I've got two other offers for you. If you pre-order before December 7th, you'll get a $10 off discount. $10 off. Or just in time for Hanukkah and Christmas. You can get a one-year subscription to CRTV for $99, and I will give you a free copy, a hardback copy of Liberty and Tyranny. It's for yourself. If you already have one, you can give it to someone as a gift. We'll also ship the book to you absolutely free. These are the holidays. We want to get our message out. We are actually having a spectacular membership drive. But I want to give you these opportunities to give it as gifts. So I just want you to think about it. You can get liberty and tyranny for yourself or for someone. You can give them as a gift. If you order CRTV, an annual subscription is $99. You know, cable and satellite, they're like $200 a month. You're going to get all our shows, $99 a year. We'll ship the book for free. Simply go to CRTV.com, CRTV.com, and select Levin Book Club at checkout. Or, if you want to cut right to the chase, give us a call, 844-LEVIN-TV, 844-LEVIN-TV, and our wonderful customer service folks will get you signed up. So we have three really great offers going on at the same time. It's $99 for a full-year subscription for all of our programs on Conservative Review TV. You'll get Levin TV. You'll get Michelle Malkin Investigates. You'll get the Steve Crowder Show, among others. And we'll be adding programs and platforms. You can get all that information at 844-LEVIN-TV. If you're a vet or in the military, you get $30 off right now. Just give us a call, 844-LEVIN-TV. If you're not a vet or you're not in the military, you're like me, a citizen, you can get $10 off if you pre-order by December 7th. Or our special for Christmas and Hanukkah, you pay the full freight, $99 a year, and you'll get a free hard black copy of Liberty and Tyranny, and we'll ship it to you for free. We have all these offers out there just for you. One other thing. You have a little kid? You have little grandkids? There's two great books that are deeply discounted right now on Amazon.com. I'm full of good ideas here, really good gift ideas. It's, what is it, Cyberspace Monday or whatever they're calling it? Proverbs for Young People. My dad's wonderful top book for young people. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, Proverbs for Young People. It is a beautiful book. You can also get My Dog Spot. It's the original Spot book. Another beautiful book by my father and mother. If you have really, really little ones, Proverbs for Young People, My Dog Spot, perfect for Hanukkah, perfect for Christmas, perfect for now. There you have it. There you have it. All these wonderful options for you on Cyber Monday. Just perfect. I hope you enjoy them all. I know you will. We salute our armed forces, police officers, firefighters, and emergency personnel, and I salute each and every one of you. Thank you for being here, my fellow Americans. Brand new Levin TV in two minutes. See you on the radio tomorrow. God bless each and every one of you.